Father, we praise you because what we've just sung is the absolute truth. That where there was no way in the fullness of time, you sent your son to die on that cross. That those who were far from you because of our sin might be brought near to you. And Lord, you did it not because of anything in us, not because uh, we could ever be good enough or do enough good, but as we say, that's who you are. So Lord, I just pray that we would understand who you are. And because of that, Lord, we would worship you as you deserve to be worshipped. Now, Father, we just pray that you would guide us into a time of the study of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. And you may be seated. I want to encourage you to go ahead and grab your Bibles. Let's go to Romans chapter 8 as we continue to walk uh, through this series right now. So how many of you here... Remember when you had black and white TV? How many of you remember when there were only three channels, so if the president was on one, he was on them all? How many of you remember when it transitioned from black and white to color? How many of you remember one of the first movies to ever do that? The Wizard of Oz. You know, television's changed a lot, hasn't it? I mean, just in my lifetime. One of the biggest uh, ways that it has changed is the way we view it and the types of shows uh, that we view. Uh, one of the most popular forms of TV entertainment now is reality TV. I don't know how much reality it is, but they call it reality TV. Believe it or not, reality TV was first introduced in America in 1985. A show called The Real World. And ever since then, of course, it has exploded. What makes reality TV, quote unquote, must see TV? Because we get invested in it. We don't know how it's going to turn out. And, and so people get sucked into it. Now, this is going to sound strange to a, a decent portion of you. Uh, not only in this room, but also on the Facebook Live uh, audience. But there was a time in which if you had a show that you really liked to watch, you had to be home and in front of that TV on that day at that time. DVR didn't exist. Think, think, think about this for a moment. Now, DVR has really changed how we do things. There was a time when Hulu didn't exist, so you couldn't just catch it the next day. You either saw it when it aired or you waited a couple of years or so till those reruns came back around. Now, I don't know how many of you use DVR, uh, but I know one person who uses DVR and it has revolutionized the way he watches hokey football. It's not me. It's my father. My dad has, has come up with what I would say is probably a pretty clever way of using DVR. He sets his DVR to record the game, and then he goes outside. And he does whatever work he wants to, and about two and a half to three hours after the game starts, he pulls out his phone to check the score. And if the Hokies have won, he goes and watches the game. <laughs> if they lay an egg like they did yesterday, he just deletes it. Now, here's the thing. If you've ever seen me at a sporting event or you've been around my kids, you know we're pretty intense when it comes to watching our teams. Guess where we got that from? That's right, my father. But this is what happened. When he started doing the, the games this way and DVRing them, he could sit down and enjoy a game. Because let's just be honest, if you've been a Hokie fan for any amount of time, you know this is true. One week, you can beat Ohio State. Six days later, you can lose to James Madison. <laughs> <clears throat> you had no idea what was coming. But here's what it would do. 
It changed it for him. Why? Because if he saw the score and knew they won, he could go and watch it as relaxed as possible. It didn't matter if they were trailing, you know, about three or four touchdowns in the fourth quarter. He already knew the outcome so he could enjoy the game. What about you? Are you stressed out about some things right now? Are you anxious about some things going on? How would knowing how it's going to turn out change how you feel this morning, how you came in this morning? See, here's a great source of, of what I hope is going to be encouragement for you. If you are a child of God, you already know how it's going to turn out. Now, you may not know every twist and turn. You may not know every detail. However, we know that because Jesus died and rose again, we as his children have this confident expectation that when we leave this world, we will enter into his eternal presence forever. We already know how it turned out. So we don't have to go running and being anxious and stressed out all of the, the time. Because no matter what the score is right now, we know what the final score is going to be. So we're going to look at a very familiar passage this morning and see how God's going to work it out. Here's the one big thing this morning. Those who are going to be saved will be saved. One of the greatest sources of encouragement right here. So let's look at Romans chapter 8. I'm going to start in verse 28 and ask if you would stand as we honor the reading of God's word together. The Word of God says this, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. For whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom He did predestinate, them He also called. And to whom He called, them He also justified. And whom He justified, them He also glorified. Would you pray with me? Father, thank You for Your Word. Thank you for the encouragement of your word, knowing that if we have truly become a child of God, we already know how it's going to turn out. Lord, that fact alone can take a tremendous weight off of our shoulders. So, Lord, as we look into your perfect, eternal word, would you speak to every heart that is either here in this room or watching us online, or even those that are going to watch it later today. Father, may your spirit have his way. And we humbly ask that you would give us ears to hear and hearts to receive the truth of your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Those who will be saved will be saved. In other words, it is a guarantee. It is finished. However you want to look at it, it's done. Now we can know that it's done because it is done through Jesus. It does not depend on you or me. So when we look at this word called in the text, what is the nature of this call? Well, the first thing it is, is it is a spirit-empowered call. Now, what I want us to see in verse 28 is this. This is not a general promise that applies to all people. But rather, verse 28 is a specific promise applied to specific people. How do we know that? Listen, he says, we know that all things work together for good to who? To those who love God. To them who are the, there's that definite article again, the called according to his purpose. And so Paul is saying that this promise of God working all things out for his glory and our good only applies to those who have been saved. And this is important because sometimes we'll, people will run around and start claiming promises that were never really given to them. You know, another thing that we see is how the rest of this passage plays out. See, nowhere in Scripture does God promise to bless all sinners. The blessing resides on those who have been saved by His grace. 
So we want to understand the meaning of this word call. The word paints a picture of being drawn. Drawn to kind of like a, a moth to a flame or deer to headlights. You ever notice what happens when the headlights hit a deer? Headlights. And they just like they're mesmerized until they total your car. It's this drawing that is happening here. Now, this is something that man cannot do on his own. We cannot call ourselves or be drawn to God on our own. We know this because of Romans chapter 3, verses 10 to 12. It says, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who seeks after God. There is none who understands. There is no one good, no, not one. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, the Apostle Paul says that we were dead in our sins and our transgressions. Dead people don't get up and walk. They're dead. This is something that God does. Not only is this something that you and I cannot do on our own, but it is also not the same as preaching the gospel. Preaching the gospel is necessary to call people, but it is not all that is necessary to bring them to salvation. You see... The Bible makes it very clear on this point. Not everybody who hears the gospel is going to be saved. This is a reality that I think a lot of people in the church need to really understand. That just because we go through some religious exercises doesn't mean that we are right with God. And I get it. That's an offensive message. You're like, well, wait a minute, Pastor. It is cold and rainy, and I am here. God bless you for that. I'm glad that you're here. But I want you to understand this. You are only here. I am only here because the Spirit has drawn us for a purpose. You are not here by coincidence. You didn't just get up and go, well, you know what? I've gone to this church every other time, so I'm just going to go there. And you didn't just do any, meeny, miny, mo on Google search. The sovereign God brought you here for a specific purpose. You see, Jesus teaches in Matthew chapter 22, verse 14. He says, for many are called, but few are chosen. Now, this is the context of Jesus teaching about the marriage supper. This, this event is going to happen when all the saints of all time are gathered around and we partake of the Lord's Supper like we did last week with Jesus. But notice what he says. He distinguishes between a general call by saying many are called. And then he implies it specifically. Few are chosen. Now this takes us back to the, the doctrine of election and the sovereignty of God. Those things that kind of uh, bring a little angst in, in us. This is also taught, if you remember back to John chapter 10. There was this group of religious leaders and some other Jews that were surrounding Jesus, along about verse 25. And they said, that's it. Tell us plainly if you are the Christ. Jesus, I already told you. If you don't want to believe what I say, then believe the works that I've done. But then he hits them with this. He goes, you don't believe because you're not my sheep. Because my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. Amen. See, here's the thing. You can... Hear the gospel. But unless you are responding in obedience, then you are not a sheep. Yet. This is why I disagree with the Calvinist statement that says, uh, they, they want to say that God's grace is irresistible. Listen, every time you and I are exposed to the gospel, if we do not willfully surrender and submit to it, we are resisting the grace of God. Now, what it does mean is this. And what I love about this passage is that while you and I for a while may resist the Spirit of God, if we are called, all right, if we have been elected by God before the foundation of the world, at some point God's grace will overwhelm us and we will come to Him. It means this, that whoever comes in faith to Jesus will come. There's no doubt about it. Now, 
How all of that's going to work out, the time, the place, all of that, that's up to God. But what we see here in Romans 8, 28 to 30, and, and some other passages is those that are going to be saved at some point will be overwhelmed by God's grace and they will surrender to it. And they will come. And they will come lovingly and willfully in submission to the Lord. Not only is the calling for salvation spirit and power, but I want us to see this. It is also God ordained. Now, there's some words in Ephesians 1 and here in Romans 8 that, again, that they kind of uh, cause hair to stand up on the back of our necks. We're like, oh, wait a minute. I don't know how I feel about this word. All right. The two words are typically election, predestination. I'll throw a third one in there. Foreknowledge. Now, those three words just kind of scare us a little bit. Why? Because we've allowed some people to hijack what they actually mean. So let's just allow Scripture to determine it, right? Let's let Scripture speak. Predestination and foreknowledge. To be predestined means to be predetermined. The word foreknowledge means to know beforehand. Now, I want us to see how these two beautifully work together for the glory of God and the praise of God. So God's foreknowledge, knowing beforehand, points us to 2 Timothy chapter 1, uh, chapter 2, excuse me, verse 19. And it says this, Nevertheless, the solid, the solid foundation of God stands, having this seal, the Lord knows those who are His. Now in that verse, Paul is actually quoting from the Old Testament. He is quoting from Numbers chapter 16. What happened in number 16? Well, there was this man by the name of Korah. And he got 250 men to agree with him that they needed to rebel against the authority of Moses and Aaron. They said, you know what? We are just as Jewish as Moses is. We know just as much about God as Moses does. Hey, Moses, who made you leader over us? We don't like your leadership anymore. We don't like where you're taking us. And so Moses essentially says, all right, I'll tell you what. He kind of challenges him to a duel. He says, I'll tell you what, you bring your sacrifice, I'll bring my sacrifice tomorrow, and we're going to allow the Lord to show the people who his are. Of course, that sounds like a good idea. So it comes to the next day, guess what? Korah and the 250 people, along with all of their family, are swallowed up by the earth. The Lord knows those who are His. See, God already knew what was coming and how He was going to handle it. And the same is true for you and I. God already knows whether or not we are going to surrender to His grace. He has already predetermined the when, the where, and watch this, the reason that you are going to be saved. Now you go, wait a minute, there's a reason I was saved? Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, we forget this so often. We, we divorce these verses from one another. Ephesians chapter 2. We know verses 8 and 9. For by grace you've been saved through faith. And not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. Not of works lest any man should boast. We were saved for a purpose. What is it? Verse 10. For we are his workmanship. We are God's poem. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Watch this. Which God hath before ordained. That we should walk in them. So God has predestined not only that you would be saved, but how you would glorify him by doing those good works. God knows every aspect of our lives. And they're completely in his hand. Isn't that amazing? All right, so we're, we're not done then. Because I want us to understand when we talk about predestination, it is only used in scripture to speak of believers. There is nowhere in the Bible that speaks of God predestining unbelievers. So why are they condemned? Because of their unbelief. John chapter 3, verses 18 and 19 say this. He who believes in him is not condemned. But he who does not believe is condemned already. Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation. That the light has come into the world and men loved darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. Jesus said, 
We are already condemned. Why? Because of the original sin back in Genesis chapter 3. We have inherited this sin nature that gives us this inclination, this desire towards sin and rejection of Jesus. But notice that God has sent the light into the world. The light is who? It's Jesus. So how does Jesus shine among the lost today? Through the proclamation of the gospel. The light is shining. So why is it that not everybody who hears the gospel, why are they not coming from darkness into the light? Jesus answers it. He said because they love their sin more than they would love the Savior. Why, why do you and I not like to, to be in relationships that hold us accountable? Because that means that our dark deeds are going to get dragged out into the light. As long as, I, as long as I try to live in isolation, then nobody has to know about what I struggle with. But when I open my life up to a brothers in Christ, and they see and they hear they can then go, hey, you know what? That attitude that you displayed, that, that action that you just took, man, that doesn't line up with the Word of God. And in that moment, when our sin is graciously revealed to us, we have two choices. We can either confess it and turn from it, or we can turn from Jesus and embrace our sin. Those are the only two options that we have. See, because of God's foreknowledge, he is causing his will and his work to be carried out in the life of a believer. When it talks about being foreknowing and predestined, it's not a passive, well, he knew it was going to happen. He is actively causing it to happen in your life and my life. Why? Well, I guess the first thing that we need to understand is... What is God's will? What has God predestined to happen in the life of believers? It's right there in the text, verse 29. God has predestined you to become transformed, to become like Jesus from the time that you are saved until the time you are in his eternal presence. So everything in your life, if you're a child of God, everything in my life is God working out his will and his plan in our lives to accomplish that purpose to make us more like Jesus now here's the thing this answers the why of suffering for Christians this whole context of Romans 8 28 to 30 actually starts back in verse 18 Paul is talking about how all of creation is groaning that we're suffering why because of sin but God has a plan and a purpose that he's working out in your life and in my life it explains the why of suffering. It, knowing that God is actively causing his will to happen in my life is why we can have joy in the middle of suffering. That's why James says in James chapter 1, My brothers, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing this, that it will produce patience, but let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. In other words, James and Paul are saying that the suffering that Christians are going through has a plan of purifying us and making us look more like Jesus. This is the why. Suffering produces patience which builds spiritual maturity. This is what God has predestined to happen in my life in your life. So if you are a child of God, it's not a question of if you are going to look like Jesus. It's not a question of are you going to suffer? Because those two go hand in hand. As we suffer, God makes us more like Jesus. So what, what does any of this mean for you and I? First off, I want to say this. It ought to encourage us. Be encouraged this morning. That whatever God is allowing in your life right now has a plan and a purpose. You and I are not the victims of random circumstances or coincidences. 
We are experiencing the divine sovereignty in the goodness and the grace of Jesus Christ in making us more like him. Think about pottery. The potter sits at the wheel and he's turning it. And he's pouring some water on it and he's using his hands to mold it and to shape it into what, in his mind, its purpose is. It's exactly what Jesus is doing to us right now. As his children, he is the potter. You and I are the clay. By the way, the clay doesn't get to tell the potter how to make it or what to make of it. Okay, don't let, let, let's not forget that part, right? But the pressures in life that you're feeling, the stress that you're feeling right now, is God having you as clay on that pottery wheel, spin it around, and he's applying pressure just a little bit more. Why? Not to hurt you, but to make you into what you were created to be. Pressure. Now, listen, I'm not, I'm not saying it doesn't hurt. I know it hurts. Nobody likes to be pressed on. Nobody likes for somebody to reach in and rip something out from us. But those impurities defile and make that piece of pottery defective. So the potter has to remove it. The sin in our lives... If God can't apply pressure to smooth it out, guess what? He plucks it out. He removes it so that we are not defiled, so that we are blameless. Go back to, to Ephesians 1. And so that we fulfill the work he has called us to do. See, everything happening around us right now, simply God working his plan out. Verse 30 reminds us that what God starts, God finishes. Amen. There is no to-do list in heaven. It's already done list. Amen. So I don't, I don't have to be afraid to go into my Father's presence. I don't have to be afraid of what's coming next because the sovereign God who loves me and bought me with His Son's blood has already predetermined how it's going to work out to make me more like Him. See, Romans 8 isn't meant to be confusing. It's meant to be encouraging. Romans 8 will help us fight discouragement when life gets difficult. I want you to watch how this whole chapter fits together. So Paul starts off, Romans 8, by saying this. There is therefore now no condemnation to who? To them who which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So if you are a child of God... You are no longer condemned. Why? Because Jesus took your condemnation on the cross. Now, Paul then goes, starting in verse 18, talking about the suffering. But he wants us to suffer with proper perspective. He's going, remember, yes, you are suffering. Why? Because we live in a fallen world. Yes, you are suffering, not because God is angry, but because he is purifying you. Remember, you're no longer condemned. And so what begins to happen is this. Because we are suffering, not because God is angry, then we're suffering for another reason. What's that reason? Verses 28 to 30. God is making us more like Jesus. And because he is making us more like Jesus, because we have been saved. Listen. We should be encouraged in the face of suffering, knowing that God is bigger than any circumstance or situation we will ever face. God is for us, and, and nothing can take us away from the power and the presence of God in our lives. So we can suffer joyfully and confidently knowing that God is making us more like Jesus. And the way that this story ends is with us in his presence for all of eternity. It's meant to encourage us as a church to suffer faithfully for the one who willingly suffered for us. How can we not be encouraged when we know that there is a God sitting on his throne in heaven who said, I'm going to work all things out for my glory and your good because you're my child. It's a whole lot better than walking around going, man, I wonder what's getting ready to happen today. Man, I wonder what was meant by that. Be encouraged.
courage, church. You are in the hands of the potter. And he is forming you and molding you and shaping you into exactly what he's called and created you to be. And you may not see it right now, but when God is done, it will be a masterpiece that is purified through the fire of trials. But it also means one other thing for us. And it means this. We must call people to faith in Jesus. Church, there is a call on our lives. And it is this. To make disciples of all nations. If we don't do anything else well, we better do that one right. Because that's the only thing that God has called us and commissioned us to do as a church. To make disciples. He didn't say have a big church. He didn't say have a lot of people. He didn't say have all these ministries. He said, I want you to go make disciples of all nations. A lot of people get caught up in terms like election and predestination or foreknowledge. And they think, oh, well, evangelism isn't that important. <clears throat> Don't swallow that lie. The words election, predestination, foreknowledge, they apply only to God. We have not elected anybody. We haven't predetermined anything. We don't know anything beforehand. God does. Does God know who's going to be saved? Yes. Do you and I? No. So we have to go and share the gospel. We have to be sharing with them. So what we really need to learn to do is to live out the words of Romans chapter 10, verses 13 to 17. Listen to this. It says, For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? It simply means a proclaimer, not me. And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah has said, who shall believe our report? So then, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Paul says not everybody who hears the gospel is going to believe. You see, if all that was required to be saved was to hear the gospel, then everybody in church that hears the gospel would be saved. But Matthew 7, verses 21 to 23 clearly refute that. It's a drawing of the Spirit that occurs. Now, I had a, a professor at Liberty taught a really neat way to understand this passage. If you've been hearing the amount of time, we've done this together, but we're going to do it again. So if you really want to understand Romans 10, 13 to 17, look at it backwards. Watch, watch what happens. When we preach the Word, God gives faith. We preach the Gospel because God has sent us. When we preach the Gospel, people will hear when they hear the gospel, they will believe. When they believe the gospel, they will call on the name of the Lord. And when they call on the name of the Lord, they will be saved. It's awesome, isn't it? It means that in his sovereignty, he is already elected before the foundation of the world who will be saved. But it also backwards means you and I have a part to play in that process. So let me ask you, who's your one? Who is that person that you've been praying for? Who is that person that you are asking, Lord, soften their heart for the gospel? Lord, allow the Holy Spirit to convict them. God, send somebody, even me, send me to go share the gospel with them. Lord, please convict them. Please draw them to yourself because we know this, that all that are drawn will Come, Jesus said in John 6. Who are you praying for this way? But here's the other reality. Maybe there's some one or more than one person in this room this morning, or even those watching on, online. They've heard the gospel. They can give you every religious answer there is, but they have never truly surrendered to the gospel. It's not changing their life. It's not changing how they live. And a gospel that cannot change you is a gospel that cannot save you. 
So the Holy Spirit, this morning, you, you're just feeling that He's just speaking. He's calling you to come in faith, trusting in His grace to save you. If you're here, you're watching, please don't resist God's grace one more moment. Don't believe the lie from Satan that, well, God gave you another chance, so he's going to give you another. Listen, God is a God of second and third chances, fourth and fifth chances for some of us slower learners. But just because God has given you another chance doesn't mean he is obligated to give you another chance. Too often we're like the guy in Luke. I said, man, life is going good. I got everything I need. I'm living the American dream. I'm going to tear down my barn. I'm going to build bigger. I'm going to pad my 401k. I'm just going to take it easy. And God says, you fool. Tonight your soul's going to be required of you. Then who's going to have all your stuff? Doesn't matter you've done or even where you're at right now. Because where sin did abound, grace did abound much more. His grace is overwhelming and it is sufficient. Stop resisting. Stop running. Start surrendering to the grace of the gospel that is sufficient to save you today. To my brothers and my sisters here, are you feeling weighed down by life right now? Are there burdens and concerns that cause you to stay up at night or toss and turn or wake you up early in the morning? Are you frustrated by situations and circumstances in your life? Are you sitting there wondering, why is this happening to me? Why now? Why this? Why that? Tell it to the Lord. Be encouraged that if you're his child, his presence is still with you. He has said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. Know that he has not left you alone to suffer in silence, but the Savior has come near to walk with you through this. To give you clarity in this circumstance. Your suffering isn't without purpose. The same Savior that has brought you to this tough season will be the one that walks through this tough season. And when his plan and his will is accomplished for this, then it'll go away. But not until. So instead of praying, Lord, remove this, start praying, Lord, help me be faithful through this. Start praying, Lord, what are you trying to teach me in this? I know you've got a plan and a purpose behind everything you're allowing me to go through. So what is it, God? What is it you're trying to say to me? What is it that you're trying to remove from my life to make me more like you? Ask him to help you learn. Ask him to remind you of his presence in this time, that you're not alone. Ask him to make you the man or the woman he has called and created you to be. And know that he will. So whatever God is saying to you this morning, let's respond to him. Let's not resist his grace any longer. Just stand with me as we're going to pray together. Father, we thank you for your love and your grace. We thank you for this opportunity to come and, and just to study your word. Lord, I, I am human. Which amongst many other things means that I don't know hardly a percentage of what you know. But you know all things, including why you have brought each of us here. While those on Facebook Live have tuned in to this service on this day at this time. Father, I don't know what you have said to us over this last hour or so. But Lord, I do pray that your will would be done. 
trusting in your word. There in Isaiah, when you said that as your word goes out, it will not return void, but it will accomplish what you desire it to. Father, I know that your will is to save those who are the furthest from you. I know that your will is to bring your children even closer to make us more like Jesus. Who exactly you're speaking to and how you're speaking, God, I don't know. But I trust that you are. Father, I pray that your spirit will push them to respond this morning. They're not responding to me or a church. They're responding to a Savior. Father, let us no longer love our sin more than we love Jesus. Bring us before your throne where we can experience grace and mercy like never before. Remind us that your grace is sufficient for whatever we're facing. And we'll praise you all the days of our life. In Jesus' name, amen. The altar is going to be open as we sing. Let's respond together.